Good morning and welcome to today's mission status briefing. With us today is Derek Haussmann, the International Space Station Lead Flight Director, who is just coming off his Orbit 2 shift. Derek? Good morning, thank you. And uh, it's good to be here today to talk about uh, what uh, is another productive and uh, very busy day on board uh, the Shuttle Endeavour and, and the International Space Station. Um, as I left the, the control center, the, both crews were wrapping up their day. Um, with uh, preparations for tomorrow's spacewalk. Of course, we'll be conducting the second spacewalk, EVA-2, tomorrow. And uh, the uh, spacewalking crew, which were EVA-2, is gonna be Drew Foistel and Mike Fink. We're wrapping up their final preparations, uh, final review of their procedures, gathering of the tools, and uh, eventually they'll be uh, spending the night in the airlock overnight. So we'll, we'll uh, button them up in the airlock and then depress it to 10-2 and 10-2 PSI and start what we call overnight campout. Um, but I'll go back and start uh, with the beginning of the day. As you heard yesterday from uh, Leroy Kane, the, the shuttle program decided to do a focused inspection, which is a procedure that uh, we have a placeholder for on flight day six, and it's a way to, to use the orbiter boom sensor system to take a closer look at areas of interest on the orbiter tile. Um, what that involves is using the space station robotic arm uh, to grapple the OBSS and pull it out of the orbiter payload bay or the, the, the cradle along the edge of the payload bay. We then maneuver the OBSS to a handoff position, at which point the shuttle arm grapples the OBSS, station arm backs off, and then the, the uh, shuttle crew executes a, a pre-planned series of maneuvers that put the OBSS in the right position so that the sensors take a look at, at the areas that folks wanted to look at. Uh, that's all completed. That was done without incident and per, per procedure. Took uh, on the order of two hours of crew time. Uh, and that uh, the data and all the imagery collected from that focused inspection is now on the ground in the hands of the imagery team that's going to do the analysis and uh, report back to the MMT. And my expectation is that uh, when Leroy is back to brief you this afternoon, you'll, you'll hear, hear uh, more about the results of that focused inspection. Um, in addition, in yesterday's briefing, we talked about an, an issue that we had yesterday during EVA-1 with Greg Shamatov's uh, spacesuit, or his, his EMU. Um, and the issue was a failed carbon dioxide sensor. Uh, when, we, uh, when we lose that carbon dioxide sensor, we have rules in place that say that we have to assume a lesser capability, so we had to cut the, uh, EVA-1 a bit short. Uh, that, again, as we mentioned yesterday, that suit uh, will not be used on EVAs 2 or 3, so uh, it will be reused on EVA-4 when Shamtop goes back outside. But what we did today was perform a, a dry-out procedure in which we uh, blow uh, cool air through the suit and, and over the sensor in an effort to dry it out. Um, interestingly enough, when we activated the suit this morning, the sensor had already been recovered. We had, we had a, a good and nominal reading from uh, the CO2 sensor, which is not completely unexpected as you know, it's moisture in the sensor that causes the problem and you would expect um, once we get the, the crew out of the suit that that moisture would abate and evaporate. But we went ahead with the, uh, the dry up procedure as planned and uh, the, the CO2 sensor looks good, so uh, we're assuming that it's gonna be good and we're gonna plan to execute anomal EVA-4. Um, but we do have pre-planned bingo points in all of our EVAs or spacewalks, such that if you have an issue at, at any point of the EVA, um, any, any number of reasons can cause you to come back inside, but we have pre-planned points at which we can back out, we understand the work ahead of us, so that we can cleanly and efficiently cut the spacewalk short. And we've got those identified for EVA-4. So our plan going in is to just take one final look at those bingos that we defined pre-flight and then to make sure that they make sense now that we've got, uh, once we have EVAs one through three behind us, and then we'll make the right decision based on what happens uh, during EVA-4. Um, we're assuming that the CO2 sensor uh, will work well, uh, but there's a lot of variables in terms of how hard Greg is, is working, how much he's perspiring, how much other moisture's in the suit, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we got a good dry out, a good sensor, um, and we'll plan a nominal EVA-4 with an understanding that if we have a repeat of the problem, we understand how to, how to back out of that EVA if we need to. Um, additionally, yesterday you, you received a, a briefing on the plans for, the, uh, for us obtaining imagery during the 25 Soyuz undock. Uh, we're still continuing working toward that goal. The, the plans and procedures are coming together. Um, in terms of the status, nothing has changed since yesterday. Uh, as a matter of fact, as I left the control center, uh, the 25S crew, uh, Dima, Paolo, and Katie, uh, were reviewing procedures and uplink messages from our Russian colleagues related to, that, uh, to the unique aspects of the, 
the imagery during the undock, and there were pl there was a plan to have a tag up uh, with the experts in Moscow to talk about those procedures. So that that plan is coming together very nicely. We have all the technical aspects nailed down in terms of the station attitude, the attitude timeline, the plan for the Soyuz, and then the plan uh, for the activities of the Soyuz crew uh, inside the spacecraft in order to get the imagery that we want to get. So that, that's, uh, I'm really impressed uh, with the off console team that has worked over the past five or six days to make that story come together. Um, now they've, they've handed that package off to the real time team and we'll start working it as a, as a nominal part of the mission uh, plan looking forward to the undock on Monday. Um, as I mentioned, we started preparations for EVA2. Um, when I did the pre-flight briefing, uh, I, 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 I identified EVA2 as, as, partic as possibly one of the more challenging EVAs just because we're actuating a number of quick disconnects or QDs uh, related to the, uh, the ammonia system. These are QDs that have, have uh, had leaks in the past and have been difficult to manipulate in the past. So there's a real possibility tomorrow that we will have some ammonia leakage as we, uh, as we set up these QDs to do the refill of the leaking uh, photovoltaic thermal control system. Um, we've got the procedures in place such that we will decontaminate the EVA crew once they get inside the airlock. We've got what we call Draeger tubes that will monitor the amount of ammonia in the atmosphere. Um, and so we feel comfortable uh, going forward with the EVA with understanding that if, if we do get uh, contaminated with ammonia, which is possible, uh, we understand how to clean the crew up and uh, keep them safe once they come inside. Um, one question that came up yesterday that I didn't have an answer for was, was the total volume of this photovoltaic or PVTCS loop that we're filling. The total volume in the system, the volume of ammonia is 55 pounds, and what we plan to transfer or top off the system with is five pounds of ammonia from the um, external thermal control system, which was one of the primary systems on the truss. I think uh, that's all I have for status. Okay, Derek, thank you very much. We'll take questions now, starting here in Houston. Uh, we'll ask you to step up to the mic, please, uh, and please remember to state your name and affiliation. Yes, go ahead. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, can you uh, just talk uh, about progress in terms of your uh, mid-deck transfer status? Yeah, actually, uh, I got a status this morning from our, our ACO, who's a flight control position in the shuttle uh, flight control room that, that manages transfer. And, and I don't have specific numbers, but he told me this morning that we were well ahead. So mid-deck transfers are all going extremely well. We didn't have a lot of transfer on this flight going in, um, but we're hours and hours ahead. Good. Gina? Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Um, you know, we heard the Pope this morning uh, visit with uh, the crew, and, uh, you know, he expressed uh, good wishes for Paolo Nespoli. And what that brought to mind is just uh, in terms of long-duration spaceflight, you'll be dealing a lot with those kind of family issues down the road. So talk to me a little bit about the wealth of knowledge you're gaining on Space Station for dealing with crews with long-duration spaceflight and their family issues and, and how you, you know, you assemble that for going beyond low Earth orbit someday. And one of the things, uh, one of the lessons learned that we, we took forward from our experience with U.S. astronauts on, on the Mir space station was, was the importance of connectivity with the folks on the ground, with family members, with mission control. And of course, on, on the Mir space station, w without a network of TDRA satellites, they had very limited communications opportunities with the ground, you know, a few hours a day um, at best. Uh, with the space station, with our with our network of TDRA satellites, we have quite a bit of coverage. I mean, at any given hour, we have 40, 45, 50 minutes of communications with the ground. So, uh, you know, any time, any issue, they can simply uh, uh, make a call to the ground, and they have all the um, resources available to them uh, that, that we're ready to provide. In addition to that, um, we have regularly scheduled personal family conferences or private family conferences, which are, are video cons with uh, with a crew member's family. And we also have what we call the IP phone, which is which is a phone that they can essentially pick up and, and dial anybody on the planet um, for large portions of the day. And it's not continuous, but uh, um, it's another important resource for the crew just to stay connected um, with friends and families and, and, uh, and relatives. Um, we also have a have an organization here at JSC 
whose job it is uh, to, to basically provide psychological support to the crew. So meet their, meet their needs while they're on orbit, the, the personal needs with, with friends and family. So I think, I, I think we actually do a really, really good job and we've come a long way in terms of, of family support and psychological support for the long duration crew members. And that's been pretty consistent feedback that we've gotten when they come home and debrief is that they, they felt very connected. Okay. Any other questions for Robert? Hi, Rob Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, tonight, uh, the space, or right soon, um, the spacewalkers will be camping out uh, for the evening. But then for the third EVA, as I understand, you're going to be doing this new lightweight exercise um, pre-breathe. And then if that works, you may do it for the fourth as well. Um, so this potentially could be the last camp out. Uh, my question is, how do you determine what works? Is it just waiting until to see if they, for this new procedure, does it, is it just waiting to see if they get the bends, or is there some test that they have to pass? What, what qualifies this new procedure versus the camp out? Okay. Now, what you're referring to is the in-suit light exercise, or what, you know, everything's got an acronym, so we refer to it as ISLE, I-S-L-E, or ISLE. Um, and first, I want to make clear that, that the IO protocol has gone through the same rigorous ground testing that the campout protocol and the exercise pre-brief protocol has done. So it's been, it's been validated with, with many, many test subjects under many different conditions against the same criteria that the campout protocol and the uh, exercise pre-brief protocol were validated against. So it's a, it's a medically proven perfectly sound protocol. So what we're doing on orbit is not a test, but it's the first time we've used the protocol. So that, that's why we decided to use it on EVA-3 by starting with it on EVA-1, because anytime you try something different with something as complicated as, as station can be with the, with the airlock and, and the computer systems and support systems, um, we like to go through it carefully and methodically. So there is no larger risk of the bends with the out protocol than there is with any of the other protocols that we've been using. Having said that, that would certainly be a, a criteria at, that at, at the end of EVA-3, we would ask the crew for feedback. You know, was there, did you feel in, any differently than you did for EVA-1 and EVA-2? Um, was, was there anything that you didn't like about the way the protocol was executed? Were there any surprises with the procedures? So, you know, really it, it's a, it's a tested protocol, it's a validated protocol. We, we consider it equivalent to the ones we're using, the ones we'll use tonight and the ones we've used in the past. But since it's new, we'll have the tag up with the crew and say, did you feel anything different, which we don't expect, and is there any, were there any surprises with the procedures? Do we need to change something? Do we, do, do we need to do something better? Does it make sense to do it on an EVA-4? Okay, any other questions here in Houston? We have reporters on the phone bridge. Uh, we'll go there now. Uh, Marsha Dunn? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, hear you fine. Um, yes, Derek, I was wondering, um, is there no way to replace the sensor in Greg Chamatov's suit or even give him a different space suit component so you don't have to worry about this on, on the uh, fourth spacewalk? Yeah, generally speaking, it, it's difficult to do on-orbit maintenance of of the spacesuits, just because of the you know the complexity of the suits and the tools and the spare parts required. Ironically enough, uh, we did fly we we did fly a spare CO2 sensor on this flight. It came up on ULF six. However, you know it was looking ahead to a point where we had a procedure in place to do the change out. So we don't have the procedure's not done. It's not validated, um, and we're not ready to do that kind of CO2 sensor change out on orbit. Although looking ahead to a post shuttle station. Um, at some point, we will be able to do that. Uh, we'll have the spares in place and the procedures in place. We just don't have it for this mission. Um, the other challenge we have is that this is an uh, extra large, um, hard upper torso or hut that Chamatov wears, and uh, we don't have another one of those on board. Um, the third thing, so it's not a simple change out. The third thing I'd point out is that there's no guarantee, even if we did change out the sensor, that we wouldn't have a repeat of this issue. Um, you know, it's all driven by moisture, which in turn is driven by many times how, how hard the crew is working. So we, what we think is the best posture at this point is to dry the, the sensor out as we did uh, today and then uh, give it a go on EV-84. Thank you. And I was just wondering if you could um, talk about your feelings and your team's feelings during the Pope's call 
Um, it was a historic moment uh, on both fronts. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that aspect, please. I, I thought it was just an amazing event, really, really a, a beautiful event. As we, as we set up uh, for the event, we set up the video and, and checked the, uh, the uh, video and the, and the uh, sound with the crew on our uh, monitors in Mission Control, we had a shot of the Vatican um, and people passing by, and then we had a, had a shot of the uh, of the Pope getting set up and getting mic'd up, and I, you know, it it was just an amazing, beautiful event. Um, I thought his words uh, um, were extremely eloquent, and uh, I, I thought the crew did a great job uh, of addressing his question. So it, it was an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bill Harwood. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Derek, a quick question from yesterday. Uh, we were told during the, the undocking uh, briefing that we got that if, once they've undocked, they cannot redock. Um, I got to thinking about that. I, I'm just curious if they really did have a problem resealing the habitation module or something like that. Is there no way to, to come back to station, or is that absolutely forbidden? Thanks. Well, I, I'll tell you that uh, a redock is not analyzed. And when I say analyzed, I mean. Uh, um, the specifics of the clearances, the, the loads on the station, um, the, thing, the, the attitude control coming back in. Um, so that is not, uh, it's not an analyzed configuration that, that we would uh, call a nominal backup plan. Um, in addition, as you heard yesterday, the, the hatch, a hatch leak scenario or an inability to close the hatch is considered a very, very remote outcome. Um, if there was a small leak, as you heard yesterday, the expectation is that, uh, that uh, we would uh, feed that leak and, and get the crew on the ground. Having said that, in the extremely unlikely scenario that you couldn't get the hatch closed, my expectation is that we would, uh, that Soyuz would station keep for as long as required, a day, maybe two days, until we as, a, as the two programs got comfortable that it was safe to redock. And my expectation in, in that scenario is that we would get there, we would get comfortable and in that unlikely event, we would redock. Thank you. Okay, uh, James Dean. Hi, thank you, James Dean from Florida today. I just had a few questions. Um, first, Eric, you, were, you, were, uh, you mentioned the potential for ammonia contamination. Uh, as I recall, the um, takeout procedures and things like that can be pretty time consuming. I was just wondering if that's built into the EVA timeline, or if um, if you do have to do something like that, is that going to uh, jeopardize getting any of the planned work done? Now, for for better or for worse, we've got a lot of experience with these quick disconnects and the ammonia leakage that often accompanies those operations. So, so what we do is we build what we call the wet ammonia quick disconnect operations, or the uh, the operations that the crew is actually opening and closing the valves and and making the connections. We build those. Uh, we build the timeline such that those activities with the so-called wet QDs are in the first half or first third of the EVA. So therefore, you know, we get to a point about halfway through the EVA where we're done with ammonia, and then we can take credit in terms of bakeout time in the second half of the EVA. For EVA two, for example, we're doing work on the the solar alpha rotary joiner Sarge. So we're getting bakeout credit for that entire time where we're doing other work. So generally speaking. Uh, we, we don't lose content if we get contaminated. Thanks. Uh, regarding that Sarge work, I was wondering if you could compare it at all to what was done on 126. I was thinking that uh, maybe that was a little bit more arduous because there was some uh, debris that needed to be uh, scraped up and cleaned off that I, I uh, presume isn't going to be necessary this time. That, that's uh, correct. But uh, oh, how similar are they? Uh, very similar operations. We, we don't expect uh, to do, like you said, we don't expect to do the kind of cleanup that was required on previous missions. Uh, the lubrication itself is very similar. And uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, this, this particular, the, the Port Sarge has been performing very well. And we're, we're a few months ahead of where this preventative maintenance would actually be required. Um, but we, since we had the opportunity, we're going to go into it, go, go take care of it now and get it out of the way. Um, but you are correct in that we don't expect we certainly don't expect and hope we don't find uh, any significant debris or any other uh, contamination on the joint. Uh, thank you. And lastly, um, 
I just have heard some uh, mentions of storm troubleshooting. I'm not familiar with what's going on there, and I just wondered if you could explain that, and is, is there any uh, potential issues regarding the uh, re-rendezvous and use of storm for that? Uh, no, no issues, big picture, no issues with uh, the, the storm hardware and no impacts or no changes to the re-rendezvous that we planned for undocking day. Okay, is that it from you, uh, James? Yes, thank you. Uh, any other questions here in Houston? Seeing none, we'll wrap up this briefing. Uh, you can follow uh, activities in space, the International Space Station and Endeavour's uh, flight, STS-134, at www.nasa.gov. Thank you for being here.